This is my friend David. David, you want to sit down for a second? Let's just let's sit down. Let's take a breather. I've asked David to play Joy to the World. So you're about what, nine? Yeah. And you're what, in third grade? Yes. All right. And as he was a little nervous today, and it's not easy getting up front of front of people. But see, they're, they're smiling faces. They're some nice people. Plus, great Bethany's waving at you. So I wanted to I wanted to read something to you, David. I did some background on Joy to the World. You want to hear it? Okay. In 1719, Isaac Watts, already a notable scholar and author, sat down under a tree in Abney State Park in London and began to compose a song based off of Psalms 98. In Isaac's younger years, probably your age, he complained that the songs in church were sung were hard to sing. And sometimes that happens. Yeah, I mean, some of those are sort of hard to sing. So his father said, instead of complaining, why not write a song? So he did, and he wrote Joy to the World. So you want to play it for us? Okay. Sure. All right. Where do you want me to be? You want me to sit down? Mm, just stand up. Stand by the piano? I'll do that. All right, let's do that. All right, come on up. Get your seat right where you want it. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you, David. David, I got something for you here. You brought me joy, and I know it's not easy. So I got your gift. I thought long and hard about it, all right? So there it is for you. You can eat it after church, all right? And maybe you should share it, too. It's up to you. Maybe share it with me. Thank you, David. I want to thank his parents, Evelyn and James. Was that a blessing or what? Well, welcome to the Shehala Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am Pastor Don, and Pastor Edder would also like to thank you for being here today. We are here to worship God and to share the joy that we should have as all Christians. This week, as I uh, was going on a Bible study with Pastor Edder, he drove. And I'm all right with someone else driving. Actually, in a cold day with heated seats, I kicked the seat back. I was quite comfortable. Until I noticed, I looked over on his dash, and the light was on for fuel being low. So the responsible person that I am tapped him on the shoulder and said, Pastor Edder, do you realize your fuel gauge is on? And he's like, yeah, don't worry, Pastor John. We got it under control here. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I like to know the limits. And I'm pretty sure we have 30 to 40 miles left. How far is this visitation going to be? And I'm thinking, wow, 
maybe I should have drove because if the car, if he doesn't have his limits correctly, then I'm assuming the car will run out of gas and without gas, the car won't run and the guy in the passenger seat will be the guy pushing the car. Am I correct on that? Dr. Miller was talking about God's word today. You know, there's so many churches around the world that don't have the privilege of having a Bible because it's illegal. Or you may die or be killed because they don't have the freedom to worship. I probably have nine Bibles. I had the opportunity to get up this morning and shower and make the choice to come to church, as you did also. There's so many things we take for granted, these freedoms. And I don't want to take that for granted. So do you have your Bibles today? And for the young people up top, do you have your cell phones with your Bibles on it today? Do you have God's Word? Open it up here with me. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse 15. reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Now, how am I supposed to communicate today, articulate, or explain this indescribable gift? But it says, Thanks be to God. So the best way to explain God's message is through his word by having the Bible interpret the Bible. In Isaiah 28, 10, it says precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, there little, here little. So let's look at this. The Apostle Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, and he's trying to say that no words can adequately adequately describe or articulate this indescribable gift. So let's look at a Bible verse. Let's go to Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6. What does the Bible have to say? We heard this over the Christmas holiday. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Now listen to this. His name will be called, let's describe him now, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. In the year 2018, which we're now in, and soon to be 2019, nearly $13 billion was spent in unwanted gifts. Christmas is supposed to be a time of joy, as David played joy to the world. But sadly, it's also a time of disappointment because of those unwanted gifts. The studies show that more than half of them face this feeling of disappointment day in and day out because of the gift they received. Some 56% of Americans, roughly 142 million adults surveyed, admitting to get at least one gift that they did not want. So prior to giving David his gift today, I made sure it was something that I thought he would want and I would want too, just in case it was regifted. Now, we laugh at that, but many times, well, sometimes, I should say, you will receive a gift in your life, and that gift might not be the gift that you want, but in thankfulness, you turn around and give it to somebody else and re-gift it to them, who then decides they don't want that gift, and they give it to somebody else. You've never done this, have you? And sometimes, awkwardly, that same gift works its way around the church. It gets back to you. I want to talk about gifts. Pastor Edward last Sabbath talked about the perfect gift of Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate gift. An appropriate gift does two things. 
One, it reveals the love of the one giving it. David, what I gave you, I love to eat. I love to eat. Yes, I gave you M&Ms with caramel in the middle. Think about the verse, the, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The second thing a gift should do is it should fulfill a need for the one receiving it. Isn't it rewarding when you give a gift and the recipient says, wow, that was wonderful and thoughtful of you, but not only that, I needed that and I wanted that. This indescribable gift in 2 Corinthians 9.15 that Paul is talking about, the gift of Jesus, does both of those things. One of the coolest gifts I received this year was a Ford Raptor. Now, if you know me, I like Ford trucks. Now, living in Texas prior to Washington, it's, it's truck country. I always owned a car and never wanted a truck. But for some reason, when I moved to Washington, I wanted a truck. And I traded in my Prius, which is a perfect pastor's car, by the way, because it gets 60 miles a gallon. And it was paid off, which is another good decision. And I go to the Ford dealer, and I trade it in on a truck. And the Ford guy looks at me and goes, Sir, we don't have this happen too often. I said, but today you will. But this Christmas, the Raptor is the F-150, but supersized. The bigger wheels, it's buff. And I have it with me today. It was gifted to me. It was unmerited. It was freely given. I don't even have to pay for it. And I'm probably not deserving of it. And I have it with me today. Here it is. Are you laughing? Because it's hard to see. It's camouflage. It's supposed to be hard to see. It's full size. There's even a full spare tire right back there. This is a Ford Raptor F-150 given to me by Zane. Thank you, Zane. And I think about this. Did I deserve this? Did I work for it? It was just given to me. As we talk about this indescribable gift, it must be an expression of God's heart for us. The recipient receives it, that's you and I, not because we've earned it, not because it's merited to us, not because I deserve it or you deserve it, but rather God loved us, as I read in John 3:16. And Jesus literally loved us all the way to death itself. Hmm. You know, we talk about war heroes. I enjoy a good war movie. I don't know why, though, because it's often a lot of killing. But we look at the people in the story who sacrifice their life for another, and we call them heroes. We as Christians serve Jesus Christ, who gave the ultimate sacrifice for us. Is he your hero today? Do you talk about him? Because if he's your hero, you talk about him. Have you set time aside out of your busy schedule to worship with him, pray to him, ask him about maybe what the next plan is? You know, Cameron was dedicated today his parents came and said they wanted to dedicate him to Jesus. That's very important. But you say, well, Cameron didn't have a choice. No, as he gets older, he will have a choice to give his life to Jesus. And that's, that's where baptism comes into play. And then he'll have a choice to marry or not to marry, where to work and not to work. These choices were all given to us because of this indescribable gift. Here's some food for thought. They say it is a thought that counts. But if we wind up giving someone a present that we don't want, how much thought do we actually put into it? I'm guilty of that. 
I'm not pointing the finger at you. I'm guilty of that. Hmm. Jesus planned his thought and this indescribable gift way before the foundation of this world. In Ephesians 1, 4, it says, just as he, being Jesus, chose us in him before the foundation of this world. So let's talk about two miracles. Two conceptions, miracles. So open up your Bibles with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I would like to do some expository preaching. That is, will we break it down verse by verse? Luke chapter 1. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about the story of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus Christ. It's always good to have a best friend, right? Right there beside you. David, it meant a lot to me when you asked me to stand beside you next to the piano. Because it says that we're friends. You were willing to play the song. I was willing to stand there next to you. John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. He was willing to share Jesus with others, to talk about Jesus, to do things that may be a little bit unusual. But let's go back to the original story. Now you say, Pastor John, I've already heard about John the Baptist. Let's put our thinking caps on, but let's maybe change it a little bit. Put the story that you know out, and let's ask the Lord to lead us in this story. Maybe we will learn new things today on it. So Luke 1, verse 5. There was in those days of Herod, the king of Judea, Herod the Great, who reigned 40 B.C. to 4 B.C., and the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, or Zechariah, which means God has remembered. And he was from the division of Abijah. Now, Abijah means son of Yahweh. So he is a priest now, and his wife was a daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, meaning God is my oath or dedicated to God. A strong biblical name. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all his commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. All right, were they sinless? We know none is sinless other than Jesus. But when Christ puts his righteousness on us, it's imputed to us. It's like him giving it to us. God's last day people will be a people who have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments, right? Revelation 14, have the faith of Jesus and keep his commandments. We don't keep his commandments to earn salvation. No, it was freely given. We keep his commandments because in John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. When we ask our children to obey us, it's because we don't want them to be hurt. And the rules are a form of love, right? Don't run across the street without looking both ways. Don't run across the street. Hold my hands. Don't touch the hot stove. Verse 7, they kept the commandments of God and the ordinances, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. You know, it's bad enough to be barren. That's to be unable to have a child. And it says there's an and in there, and they both were well advanced in years. So not only is she barren, so she couldn't have a child even when she was younger, but now they're older. Do we see people in their 80s having children today? I haven't. So now they're older. They're both advanced in years. Verse 8, so it was that while he was serving as priest, Zechariah, before God in order of his division, it was his turn to serve, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense, where he went into the temple of the Lord. Verse 10, now why he is in there burning incense, what are the people on the outside doing? They're praying. It says the whole multitude of people are praying outside. I'm going to ask you a question. Are 
How many of you prayed today before coming in? How many of you prayed and asked for God's leading today in this service, in the Sabbath school service? How many of you, there's something about prayer that we forget the significance of. It's asking. James 4, 2 that I often quote says, we do not have because we do not ask. We need to ask God. That's saying, I can't do it, Lord, but guess what? You can do it. But when we go in and say, I'm going to do this, look at me, look at me, what usually happens? Look at me, fall. We've experienced that. It's called sin. Sin equals what? Separation from God and pain. It may be a little bit enjoyable in the very beginning while you're sinning, but we know the long-term effect of sin is death and destruction. What was I before, pastor? I was a police officer. What did I uphold? I've held the laws of the state of Texas. Did I do it because I wanted to enforce the law? No, I did it because I wanted to protect the people. And on my squad car, it said to serve and to protect. Even in a non-religious society, we, there was a purpose and a reason for a law. So when I asked someone to put a seatbelt on, it wasn't to shove it in their face. It was to save them from when I come and work their car accident, their face is not smashed on the windshield. There's a reason we have rules and laws, and it's not a bad thing. You know, I quoted it, but I'm just going to read it. Genesis is the beginning of the Bible. Revelation is the end of the Bible, which is the revealing of Jesus. The last book of the Bible has great significance. Revelation 14, 12, and it says, here's a patient of the saints. We have to be patient, right? Christ isn't here yet. There's patience involved. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Luke 1, the whole multitude was praying outside. When people pray, good things happen. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar. Can you imagine that? Try to put yourself in John or John's shoes, Zachariah's shoes right now. Try to put yourself in his shoes. He's burning incense to the Lord. He's probably praying right then there. They're praying outside, and the angel of the Lord appears to him. Standing on the right side of the altar. Don't miss it. The right side has great significance. And the end times, the sheep and the goats, the sheep will be on the right, and the goats will be on the left. When Jesus is seen standing, when Stephen is stoned, and Stephen looks to heaven, he sees Jesus standing on the right side of God. Over and over, the right is a side of power and authority. Have you read that? Have you seen that? The angel now is standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fell upon his, and fell upon his face, and fear fell upon him. Now, I imagine that's what you and I would do. And this is what I love about the Bible. This is what I love about angels. What did the angel do? Verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer has been heard. Which prayer is that? For your prayer has been heard. Which prayer was that? For your prayer has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, God is my oath. Elizabeth, dedicated to God. Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. John means the Lord is gracious. Being barren without child in those days was a sign of great reproach. It was a negative. Even sometimes today, sadly, sometimes people are looked upon if they don't have children. And many people can't have children. Think about in the Bible. Now, we're in Luke, which is the New Testament. They had the Old Testament at that time. 
Who else in the Bible was barren? Can you think of anyone? How about Sarah? Do you remember Sarah and Abraham? She was barren. Keep your, put your bookmark in Luke 1, and let's, we're using the Bible, interpret the Bible. Let's go over now to Genesis chapter 16. Verse 2. Well, let's start with verse 1. Genesis 16, verse 1 and 2. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, or Abram, had borne him no children. She's barren. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Now go over to chapter 17 now. Chapter 17, verse 4. God makes a covenant with Abraham. A lasting covenant. God doesn't break his promises. We break our promises. I don't want to, but I have. God doesn't break his promises. Listen to this. 17 verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Now, as God is telling Abraham this, how is this really going to happen if his wife hasn't had any kids? Because it's the wife that has to have kids to carry on your name, right? And God says, you'll be the father of many nations. Look now at verse 17. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? 90 years old. Did she bear a child? Yes, she did. What was his name? Isaac. So Elizabeth had that story to look back on, right? What about anybody else in the Bible can you think of? What about Rebecca? Rebecca was without child. Turn to Genesis 25, verse 21. Man, what did the pastor talk about today? All I know is he read lots of Bible verses. We're a Bible-keeping church. If you want me to preach about what I think, it doesn't really matter what I know. This is a describable gift. It's not humanly describable. Human wisdom is foolishness, as the Bible says. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. God's word will light the path, as it says in Psalms 119.105. Look here now in Genesis 25, verse 21. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea. Now when Cameron the third was dedicated today, I gave the illustra illustration of Hannah, who was praying in the temple for a child, and she was barren without child. And God answered that prayer, and she had Samuel, and she gave him back to the Lord, hence where dedications come from today. God has gifted me with two wonderful children. As much as I'd like to take credit for it, even if they look a little bit like me, there's very little that I did. God formed them, as it said in Psalms 139 there. He knit them together in the womb and made them very special. Rachel later on had Joseph, as we know, and then Benjamin, and she died sadly during childbirth with Benjamin. So that's four women right there. Now let's go back to Luke, Luke chapter 1. Bear with me now. Because in this sermon, a Bible study has broken out. Let's read verse 13 again. This is so good. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You shall call him his name John. God is gracious. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at this birth. Verse 15, And he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Now, often we want to be great in the sight of man. What's more important, to be great in the sight of man or be great in the sight of God? Now, we'll all probably say great in the sight of God, but often we lend our ear to what man says. Turn on the news, watch an hour of news. The newscaster is a man telling you what's happening throughout the world. Most likely he's telling you about Matthew chapter 24, end time events. You're listening to a man. 
when we can just read it right from God's Bible and God tells us these things. Remember when Samuel now, who's now grown up and he's looking, God says, there's a king for you to anoint from the sons of Jesse. And Jesse prays his sons in front. Samuel goes, oh, this must be the king. This must be the future king. God says, you look on the outside. God looks on the heart. That's what we do. All right, let's go back to Luke again. He will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will be also filled with the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer today. Even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God. Wouldn't that be a great You know, someday if God doesn't come while we're still alive, we'll be over across the way in the cemetery next door. I've buried many of friends over there already who used to sit in these same pews, who I've held many conversations with. And as I look at these tombstones, there's ways that we all want to be remembered. How about this for the tombstone? He will be great. He was great in the sight of the Lord. Mm. He will also go before him. Who's him being Jesus? In the spirit and power of Elijah. Did Elijah have great power? He had amazing power. Is Elijah here today? No, he was translated to be with God. Either this is a book of the best stories ever, or it's false. You're either believing it's true, or you believe it's false. There's really no in-between. Because these stories are humanly impossible. But at the same time, when I read these stories, and I pray about these stories, and I ask for these gifts in my life, I have a peace beyond understanding that only God has given me that this world has never offered me. So that is why my testimony of Jesus is so powerful, because no one can deny who we love. They can call us names. They can put us down. They can say all these things that may be true about us. But when they say, how did you fall in love with Jesus, you cannot deny. So the question today, have you fallen in love with Jesus? Let's keep going back to the story. To make a people ready for the Lord. I'll tell you what, one of my fears right now is that sentence right there. To make a people ready, prepared for the Lord. I'm held to an accountability even higher than you as a pastor. There's accountability that God says, you have to prepare my people for the Lord. Now, yes, it is your choice, but how am I using my time to serve him? Verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this, Lord, for I am old, and my wife is well advanced in years. Human wisdom, right? That's human wisdom. And the angel answered said to him, listen to this. I know you're probably tired, but listen to this. This is powerful. The angel says, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. What was Zechariah doing? He was in the temple worshiping. The angel comes down, taps him on the shoulder, and says, your prayers have been answered. Well, angel, how do I know this is true? Gabriel, how do I know? Because Gabriel says, I stand in the presence of God. And he was sent to speak to you to bring you these glad tidings. Throughout the Bible, everything, that's an absolute, that's not fair. The majority that I read is God is trying to give you life. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God says, I've come to give you life. Not just life, he doesn't leave it there, he says more abundantly. But yet we don't take it. You know, I'm raising two daughters right now, and it's challenging at times, as good as they are, and they're going, oh boy, Dad's talking about me, and he's there. But the thing is, I've experienced 46 years of pain and joys, and there's got to be some truth in that, I hope. So when I say don't drive over 100 miles an hour, there's a reason I say that, or don't say or do this, there's a reason I say that. God's Word, He's our Father, and He's saying, there's a reason I'm saying this. Are you listening to me? Are you praying to me? I 
However, there's a, another gift, daily given. Daily given. The breath of life. What's eternal life going to be like? We don't know exactly. In Adam Saddam school class, we were, we were reading uh, Revelation 21, where it talks about no more pain, new bodies, no more tears. But breath will be lasting and eternal. Is it true? I believe it is. So as we celebrated Christmas this last week, we celebrated Christ's birth, which is the ultimate gift that keeps on giving. But however, this is a gift too that you must receive. When Zane gave me this car, he says, John, I know you like Ford Raptors. It's, a, it's the nicest hot wheel out there. I didn't disagree, but I could have done one of two things. Either I take it and I say thank you, which I did, or I push it back and say I don't want any part of that. It seems so easy, but yet we have such a difficult time giving God all of us. When I married my wife, I keep reminding her marriage is forever. <laughs> when I married my wife, I said I would give her all of me. Did you not say that, everyone else in here? All of me? That doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. I've struggled with that. It doesn't mean we're going to say everything right. I've struggled with that. Sorry is a good way. Flowers always are nice. My friend Bill always says, take your wife flowers and count her hair. That's good advice. Take your wife flowers and count her hair. And I think about that. What does he mean, count her hair? God knows how much hair I have on my head. He knows how much hair my wife has. It takes time to count the hair on someone's head. And most likely, if I'm counting the hair, then I'm looking into her eyes. Isn't that what God asks of us? Take time with me. Look to me. This week in the mail, I received a Costco Connection magazine. And I also got my credit card, too. I got them both. Half of my uh, bill was from Costco, so I'm a, apparently a big supporter of Costco. But I thought it was quite significant. Bob, do we have a photo for that? A significant, significant because it says old life and new life. Old life and new life. Life after work. Five steps to the best retirement ever. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking symbolism, wow sort of reminds me of a cross. And I think about retirement. When people ask me about my retirement, I always tell them I have the best retirement ever. Well, what do you mean? It's the best retirement ever. It's literally out of this world. Wow, Pastor John. And I do. I say that. So let's see what Costco has to say. I prefer to take it from the good word, but it says, number one, they said the top five. I'm going to give you my top five from God's word next. Don't call it retirement. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to be here another 10 years still preaching to you. Yes, I want to be preaching to you, but I don't want to be here. I want to be there. I don't want to look for retirement. I always say the church is a hospital for sick people, but it's not hospice. We're going to grow out of it, and hopefully God's going to take us home with them very soon. So don't call it retirement. Get the Medicare thing right. I'm not even sure what that means. Three, create a team. We're a family of God. Okay, I'm all right with that. Figure out where to live. I'm telling you right now where I want to live. Number five, make the most of your time. That's probably the best one. Make the most of your time. So I wrote five down, five steps to the best life ever. Choose, choice. I'm gonna simplify it. Choose Jesus, number one. Number two, believe he is who he says he is. You know, Pastor John, I believe most of this, but not all of this. No, 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 you either believe it all or none of it.
Number three, accept. Choose, believe, accept. Accept his plan for your life. In Jeremiah 29, 11, we often quote that. God says, I know the plan I have for you. Plans of peace and not of evil to give you hope and a future. My prayers change. It's taken me a few years. My prayers, Lord, I want to claim that verse in my life. Jeremiah 29, 11, but not just 11, 12, 13, and 14, where it says we must go pray to him, and it says we have to give him all our whole self to him. Verse 14 says, and I will be found by him. So we'll find him if we search for him. So follow, number four, follow the great shepherd. And number five, if we're going to receive his indescribable gift, we have to take it. As God hands it to us and offers it up, are we going to accept it? So choose Jesus. Believe he is God and our Savior. By the way, Jesus means Savior. Accept his plan for our lives. Follow the great shepherd and receive an indescribable gift. I'm going to end with a poem today. If you would have asked me in college if I would end the sermon with a poem, first of all, I would have said I never would have been a pastor. Actually, I said that many times in college. And second of all, I would never end with a poem because poetry is not my thing at all. That was my worst grade in college, if I remember correctly. So my uh, teacher would probably be proud of me. Well, maybe not. Well, let's read it to you. As I'm writing the sermon, I'm praying, and this is what comes to mind. I'm saying, really, Lord, you want me to share a poem with them? But it comes to my heart, so I'm going to share it with you. So be, be loving. There's one more gift to be given, one more gift to receive. Is a gift that keeps on giving, one for you and then one for me. Yes, it is one indescribable gift from our eternal king. The gift is not riches, beauty, power, or even great favor, but rather an indescribable sacrifice from our Savior. So let us not grow weary in doing good, as one may say, but forever serving the one who very soon will be on his way. And on that great day of his arrival, may not one be missing. That's my prayer for each one of us. May not one be missing for this indescribable gift that our Creator is giving is us forever living. Yes, living because of the great gift our Defender gave so that forever we might be with our Redeemer and eternally be saved. Hmm. So today, as I close, you know, it's interesting, as I found this Bible this week, this was gifted by my mother. Who, she gave this to me when I was 15. My mother passed in 2010. My father passed in 2008. So when I see notes from my father saying, I love you and appreciate you, and they gave me a Bible, and I open the Bible and I see a dedication date of 122587, it has value. It's a gift that doesn't get old. This suit's going to wear out. This body is wearing out. Listen to this message. Our most precious and valued son, we love you so much and are thankful God gave us you. Thank you for sharing Cameron with me today. while on this earth and through all eternity. Brothers and sisters, there's only one of two choices you can make today. Either it's true or it's not true. God is working on your heart. It doesn't matter what I say. It matters what God says. And he says, Revelation 22, 7, I'm coming quickly. Revelation 22, 12, I'm coming quickly. Revelation 22, verse 20, right at the very end of the Bible, it says, surely I am coming quickly. 
Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing that you abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit by accepting this indescribable gift from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I ask in, in, in His holy and saving name. Amen, amen, and forevermore. Amen.